This episode of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on June the 8th, 2015. Enjoy! On this edition of Computer Club Lesson, we're going to discover what disaster is. Disaster is one of these. Disaster is when this stops working. We have a few more questions about Windows 10, and uh, we'll investigate some of the power settings for sleep and hibernation on your computer. And uh, we'll have a quick look at how and why screensavers work. All that and more on this edition of Computer Club Lesson. Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Today we're going to talk about disaster, and the um, this is all inspired. This lesson is inspired by our own Brenda, who called me on Tuesday and said, "Can you please come and look at my computer? It's black." Well, I picked up Brenda's computer and I brought it home with me and I put it on my bench, and it was dead. Dead, dead, dead. Now, ordinarily, that would not be a bad thing in ordinary circumstances because sometimes you, it, it all depends on what makes it go black. Uh, sometimes it's just the bulb in the screen burns out or some, uh, the battery is not quite right or something like that. But in this case, the brains of the outfit, the hard drive, failed completely. It failed electrically. They can fail mechanically because remember, there's a spinning disc inside of there with bearings. But in this case, it failed electrically. Uh, the other failure that can happen is it can fail programmatically. In other words, the operating system can make a mistake and um, mess up the file allocation table. And once that's messed up, then the computer can't read the files off of it. That is repairable. That is repairable. An electrical fault or a mechanical fault is not repairable. And in that instance, in those two instances, you lose everything, which is what happened here. And so you can call it what it is, a disaster for the average home user for the business user, um, whoever relies on these things here um, to get work done or for their business. If this fails and it's unrecoverable, boy, do you have a problem. Because these things can go for, they're like refrigerators. You can buy a brand new one and it will run for two months and poop out. Well, you can go back to the store and get another one. Same with these. They can run for a month or two or a couple of weeks and poop out. Or they can run for 30 years and not have a problem. Now, where's the bigger disaster? It poops out in two weeks or it poops out in five years? No, the bigger disaster is five years because you've got more and more and more information that is unrecoverable. In two weeks, okay, there's not a lot happening. Maybe you got a dozen songs on it. Maybe you got a dozen pictures off your camera or something like that. But in five years, there's a lot of material on there that's gone forever. So there's your disaster du jour. No, it's it's relatively old. It's relatively old. Yeah, so it's five years, six years old. Um, these things happen. It's not 
if a hard drive will fail, it's when. And how does it fail? If it fails electrically or mechanically, I'm sorry, I can't help you. If it fails programmatically, that's another story. I can, in most cases, recover the important stuff with software and robust computers and tricks I know. I can recover the files from a pro programmatically damaged hard drive, but not in this case. Is the blue screen the same kind of problem? Uh, a blue screen of death can be an indication that this is starting to fail, either programmatically or mechanically. Okay, um, But if you're getting a lot of blue screens, it might be time to back everything up and um, reinstall the operating system can be a big help. It can take care of those problems of programmatically failing. Um, the file allocation table is only a little messed up and a reinstall of Windows usually fix it. Or the hard drive is in failure mode. It's fa failing slowly or it can go away in the next couple of minutes. Okay, we've talked about disaster. So that begs the question, well, what can you do to avoid disaster? Backup, 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 backup. <laughs> May I say it again? Um, but how do you back up? Okay, how do you do it? What tools can you use to get your stuff back? Separate drive. A separate drive is good. Um, backing up onto recordable media like DVDs is a good way to do it. Uh, backing up in the cloud, you can if, if you've got enough room um, on an old Google account, sometimes you get as much as 20 gigs on a Google account. That's a lot of room to back up a lot of stuff. Um, or you can buy cloud services to back up all your stuff. Uh, your pictures, your documents. Um, that's what you really want done. And may I suggest that perhaps the best way to back up your computer is to use cloud services wherever you can. So you get an account on Dropbox and you pay for it and you get one terabyte of, of uh, space to back up your stuff and you just, over time, instead of saving it in, you know, in locally in a local folder, owner folder, um, pictures, whatever, you use that same setup in Dropbox and just save it to a Dropbox folder. I don't get that. The computer crashes like mine did. Well, the cloud's on there. Well, you did not save the stuff no, I had to the cloud. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. You saved it <laughs> locally, and cloud. yeah, and yeah. this, yeah, the cloud is there. Why not use it now? In your case, Brenda, your mail is good because it's on the cloud, oh. so you don't lose your mail, and you, most importantly, you don't lose your contacts. No. Okay, if you had been doing everything on Windows Live Mail, which is local to the computer, that would have been gone. I couldn't save them. But because you're using Hotmail in Outlook.com, you're on the cloud for your mail. Good for you. Okay, we will, uh, there are all kinds of other services that you can use. Like I said, Dropbox is one, that's a good one. Um, you can use Google services if you have a Google account. What about the Windows Cloud? Oh, okay. Uh, um, um, when you say Windows Cloud, that's OneDrive. Yeah. Okay. You, I think you start off with uh, one gig of... Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how, how much space they give you for free. But what you want to do is have 20 gigs of cloud storage space. And if you fill that up, um, you can buy more. And the next thing I suggest that you do is go out and get a life because <laughs> you're spending entirely too much time on your computer. Um, so 
uh, cloud services for my money are the way to go. Uh, everybody here has a fast, um, a fast enough internet service to upload stuff to the cloud. It may take all afternoon to upload 20 pictures, but do you have anything else to do? <laughs> to get them back, you can get them back 10 times quicker than what you uploaded them at. Um, and well, you use you 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 uh, sign up for the service, and um, and you uh, are given space on the cloud. And then you can arrange folders in that space that are yours, your personal folders. You can arrange them as you would um, your own um, your own local folders on the computer. Uh, you can arrange them with contacts and and stuff you have on the desktop. You can save your save downloads to it. Everything you can save pictures and music and videos and everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, you can, if you save something locally, you can move it to a cloud folder, or uh, when something is created, you can just say save it to a cloud folder. Um, over the summer, I will probably um, try and make some videos about cloud services um, for you to give you an idea of, of where to get them, how to set them up, and how to use them. Uh, a little 10 minute cloud uh, video will be sufficient enough explanation of how the cloud works. I really don't want to get into how the cloud works today. Uh, I just want to make, uh, make sure you understand it's there. And it is a good place to back things up. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, you can back up on um, local hard drives that you might buy an extra one, a USB hard drive or whatever, uh, plugs into your computer, you can back it up on that. Uh, you can back it up on um, archival media such as a DVD. Now, in, th in both those cases, the, the backup is local to you. It's in your house, okay? But if you have disaster in your house, it's gone. But if you've got it backed up on the cloud as well, Okay, that's called off-site backup, and that's the way to do it. Have it in three places, really. Have your backups in three places. That's really the, uh, a good rule to go by, three different kinds of backup. Okay, um, now I should tell you that uh, there are certain instances where uh, no matter what you do, where you save this stuff to, uh, there are a couple of kinds of, of uh, virus malware, scumware especially, um, that can hold your computer for ransom. What it does is it gets onto your computer and it encrypts all of your files, your documents, your pictures, your music, it encrypts everything. You can't break the encryption. You got to pay the guy that's holding your computer for ransom for the encryption key. Okay? And it's not a couple of bucks. Anywhere from 300 to 2000. Now, if the stuff you have is really 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 important, your business depends on it, you're going to pay to get the stuff back. Do you get it back though? Okay. In most cases you do. You do, because if it was if a, if these crooks criminals uh, were of the bent, bent, well, they took your money and didn't give you the encryption key. Okay, that news would soon get around. Well, don't give them money. Your stuff is gone. Okay, no matter what, it's gone. But for this particular kind of ransom to work, um, you have to put the word out that yes, the keys are in available to unlock your stuff. And so if you're going to pay all this money to get your stuff back, you want some certain assurance that the key that you're going to get is going to work. Okay, so that's, that's how that particular brand of criminality works, is uh, at least the criminals are good enough to give you your stuff back. 
<laughs> yeah, honest crooks. If they were dishonest crooks, that word would get around quick and then everybody would know, well, don't give them the money, your stuff's gone anyway. Um, if you do nothing about something like that, where your stuff has been encrypted, and you give your computer to me, in some instances, in some instances, I can recover it. Because in Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, 8.1, and 10, as they're coming along, most people don't know that the computer makes what's called a shadow copy. So if you plant a picture in a brand new picture in your pictures folder, the computer will make a hidden copy in a shadow volume of that new document, that new picture. And I'll just put it away there for safekeeping. Now, it doesn't update any changes you might make to it, so if you're doing it with a document and you're updating it all the time, it just has a copy of the original. It doesn't update. But having a shadow volume, um, I have a tool which I can put on your computer which will give me access to the shadow volume and then I can copy your stuff out of the shadow volume that you can't see back to where it should be. In most cases, in most cases, we can do about an 80% recovery. Now, um, think about the, uh, the bride who had all her wedding pictures on her computer and it was taken over by a virus and it encrypted everything. Luckily, luckily, she had a great head on her shoulders and shut the computer off immediately and took it to one of my colleagues who knew about shadow volume. So $5,000 worth of wedding pictures were recovered. Okay, they were recovered. Good thing too. Okay, so that's recovery of data. That's backing up data. <clears throat> what can you do to help ameliorate the problem on an ongoing basis of whether your computer might crash and take everything with it? Um, being careful about the websites that you go to um, as good an antivirus as you can get um, using malware sniffer programs like malware bytes having them available these are all good things um, watching out for your computer getting a little bit flaky Blue screens of death, if they happen once in a while, maybe once or twice a month, that's your, your computer telling you something. I'm ill. I'm not quite right. A, a blue screen of death every six months or so, yeah, okay, I can live with that. But if it's happening once a week or once a month, it's time to get that off to a technician to have him go over it with tools that can diagnose hardware problems or coming hardware problems because they will come eventually hardware hardware will fail it's not if it's when um, the newest computers don't have these anymore they don't have spinning hard drives they have non-volatile memory flash type drives which are very fast they're 20 30 100 times faster than this um, which makes computers a pleasure to use anymore uh, because the everything loads so quickly the computer um, a computer built to use um, um, this kind of flash memory drive will boot in 10 seconds or under and manipulating files 
on it is an absolute ple pleasure because when you uh, want to re-render a picture instead of you know your progress bar going like this and like this it's just it's done they're not cheap but that's the coming uh, flavor of how computers will work in the not too distant future uh, the best ones work that way now okay so there we go that's disaster um, how to recover from disaster well it's going to take a guy like me to do it you probably will not be able to do it on your own because you will not know where to start um, it takes a good deal of training and knowledge and tools to discover what and how it has failed in this case it took me about 20 minutes to figure out that this was the problem and it was unrecoverable. It took me about 20 minutes. I couldn't just look at the computer and say, mm, that's what did it. Um, I had to run some tests on it and once I narrowed the test down to this, then I ran another test to say, well, can you do anything with this computer? Mm, no. Sorry. So off to the store and got another one. Any questions about disaster? Been there. Been there, done that? Okay. I'm going to talk about the recover one one thing that you will probably be able to do, Brenda, to, to get back um, your iTunes music, the stuff you've paid for. Yes. Okay. Um, I put iTunes back on your computer. Um, you need to log into your iTunes account with your iTunes ID and, and your password. You probably have those written down somewhere. Oh, yes, everything's okay. Down. <laughs> now, before you do that, before you do that, you can do a search for Recover iTunes Music Apple. And among the first entries that you will get are uh, from Apple support on how to recover your iTunes music from iTunes because you can um, in your I can't show it to you now because I don't have a working iTunes account but you can go in there and you can look at the stuff you have purchased and iTunes will divine whether it's there or not and if it's not it will give you the opportunity to download it again Okay, so if you've all your if you've purchased the music, your purchases are safe on iTunes. So you can discover how you know through iTunes to get the stuff back. The other music you had is gone, uh, but the stuff fortunately the stuff you paid for is recoverable from iTunes. Uh, any programs that you had on the computer um, outside of what I've given back to you. Uh, you will have to re-download them and install them, uh, but I've given you what you should have. <laughs> what you should have. Beyond what's there, think very, very carefully about putting any other programs on the computer. Do you mean things like uh, the games that I play? They're all right, right? Yeah, yeah. If you've got them on disk, you can probably reload them. Oh, okay. If if they are if they are cloud games, like you have you log in through a website to get to them. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. If you had had stuff on disk, uh, games on disk, or or uh, um, projects on 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 disk, um, like a family tree program or something like that, you'd have to reinstall it. Um, but anything that you do in the cloud, you in other words, you go through a web page to get to it. All that stuff is still there. You just have to log back in again. Oh, the bank accounts and all that? Yeah. Uh, you just have to log back in again. And remember to tell the webs, uh, the, uh, your internet browser to remember me. To remember this number and to rem uh, if you I want. Do, yeah. yeah. You, you got to tell it to uh, remind it, remember me. And the next time you log in, all your, your information there. will be there. But for the first time around, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So you've got that stuff. You've got all this stuff written down somewhere. You're good to go. 
Good for you. <laughs> that is something else that you should be prepared for. Um, in the event of a disaster, you'll have to put everything back in again in the way of logins. So before you have to do it, make sure you can do it by making sure passwords work or if you've changed them you'll have to re redefine what they were <laughs> okay you mean the original password well the the, the latest password okay. you were using okay if you changed it over time um, and you didn't write it down it just remembers okay that can be problematic now there are programs there are programs that you can get and if you want to ask me about them on the quiet I can tell you what they are but I will tell you that there are programs which um, if you can't remember a password but it's uh, the the um, program is working anyway especially mail okay especially mail um, once you've entered the credentials for your mail locally okay on on Windows Live Mail or Outlook Express or something like that you might have done that six, seven, eight, ten years ago. And I don't know how many people have, I've said to, well, what's your email password? And they say to me, quote, unquote, I don't have a password. <laughs> I just click on it and it works. <laughs> well, folk, you do have a password for mail. It's how it works. So there is a program that can recover um, your email password. When you bring up your email program and if you go and look at the properties you'll see that there's asterisks there this thing can divine what's behind the asterisk so it can give you back your password um, before you really do need it and you don't have it it can't some websites it can do and I found this really really handy uh, when I'm repairing computers to be able to put back passwords uh, for clients who have forgotten them okay before I started I used this program to look everywhere for passwords and I got most of them um, the other thing that you want to make sure that you have properly is your license number your OEM number now unfortunately Brenda for you or fortunately for you um, I wasn't sure what version of Windows you had on your computer. Um, so you got a nice little upgrade. <laughs> but I had to use a number other than what is on your computer, the OEM number, because you had my uh, Windows Home 7 Basic and I gave you home premium and the basic number wouldn't work <laughs> so I had to fix it but it's fixed you got a nice little upgrade but that's something else um, make sure that you understand what OEM number is on your computer that's the the Windows sticker it's it's on the bottom of your laptop yeah yeah uh, in in most laptop uh, towers it's on the computer somewhere in the back or on the side maybe even on the bottom but it is there uh, make sure you understand what that number is and whether it's correct because over time somebody might like me may have had to fiddle that number no <laughs> but there is a program which can reveal it I wrote one and there is another one out there that can do even more um, to reveal your OEM number. Um, okay, so that's, that's uh, going forward. That's something that you need to prepare for disaster. Make sure you have all of your passwords written down somewhere um, because you might say, well, I don't need a password for that, but in actual fact, you do witness the email okay um, so after the disaster happens and 
you finally got your computer back and it's brand new as it was um, in the beginning with all of the 203 updates that it took plus 17 more this morning. Um, now what do we do about keeping the computer um, in a condition where um, disaster is not going to happen again? Um, it used to be that technicians and security people would say to you, don't write your passwords down. Somebody can get a hold of them. Get into your computer with the passwords you have written down. Um, that may be true in the, in the business environment. But for you home gamers, please write them down. Put them in a safe place. Do not put them in a file on your computer. I asked one client one time, well, do you have all your passwords? She said, yeah. Uh, if you look on the desktop, you'll see a little file there called passwords.txt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I can't see that because I, your computer is unrecoverable. Yes, you can, you can make a file called txt and put all your passwords in it and then print it. <laughs> okay, keep, keep it updated. Um, any more questions about disaster? Anybody? Yes? One, just one little question about backing up. Uh, yes. Backing up stuff. I need, a, I need a Google account with a password. Yes. I'm starting right from scratch. A yeah. brand new computer. Um, I, you said Dropbox. I'll probably have an account there. Well, you can you can sign up for an account at drop, dropbox.com. Dropbox, yeah. yeah. And then the cloud. Well, the, the cloud, Dropbox is a cloud. Yeah, Google is a cloud. Um, um, Flickr for pictures is great because they give you unlimited storage. Um, yeah, Flickr can be a little difficult to, to uh, learn to navigate around. Um, but it is, if, once you figure it out, it's a great place to put pictures because you'll never lose them again. And the storage for pictures is unlimited. Um, anything else? Anything else? Yeah, can I ask you again? I told my friend I'd ask, like I said, she just shuts the computer. Should she turn it off once in a while? Yes. Um, putting your computer to sleep when you're not using it can be a, uh, a good thing. Um, closing the lid turns the, turns the display off, uh, the display takes power, it does heat the computer up if you've got a big display and it's turned on full brightness. So closing the lid and putting it to sleep, that's fine. You can do that through, uh, three or four or five times during the day. You get up in the morning, turn your computer on, and you know you're going to be back at it in two hours. Yes, close the lid and put it to sleep or use the sleep button. Um, but when you're done with it at night, shut it down properly. That does two things. Um, it saves this spinning hard drive because no matter what, when the computer is sleeping, this is still spinning. Okay, at a slower speed, but it's still spinning. Um, and it it uh, saves on wear and tear on your on the uh, the backlight bulb on your screen. Uh, to turn it off. Um, you asked me, is there a difference between sleep and hibernate? Yes, there is a big difference. When the computer goes to sleep, it turns off things like the wireless connection, the screen. It powers down a little bit on this so it's not spinning as fast. Uh, and when you open the lid and tap the space bar, everything comes back, boom, you're there. Or that's the way it should work. When you hibernate the computer, it's, think about a hibernating bear. It's not dead, it's not turned off, but it is sleeping deeply. That means that the screen went to sleep, and, but before it went to sleep, um, 
the computer backed up in a file how it was running before it went into hibernation. So everything about what was on the screen, what was in memory, what was in uh, the, the uh, RAM memory, um, how the computer was configured at that moment that it went into hibernation is put into a file. And when you wake it up from hibernation, it looks to that file to say, how do you want me to run? Waking up from hibernation takes almost as long as a cold boot. Almost as long, but not quite. Um, because it's got to go through this whole, this whole file that it created of how do you want me to run. Now the other thing about hibernation that I don't like about it is that if for some reason you got a nasty in your computer, when you, when you hibernate, that nasty is saved in this file. How do I run? When I wake up, how do I get back at the computer? Okay, so the, the nasty comes back. And if that nasty is uh, a logic bomb that is sitting there thinking to itself, okay, on, on this certain hour, on this certain day, given this set of circumstances of connectivity, go off. The logic bomb is sitting there. It may do nothing for weeks, and then it meets all of these criteria to go off and infect your computer with malware. Logic bombs are a big part of how malware works now, because it used to be that you could um, you could just simply roll the computer back to the day before the malware happened. Okay, but now you don't know when that is. It could be two weeks before the malware infection came. And if you roll it back only a couple of days, there's that logic bomb sitting there waiting to go off again. And hibernation is, an, is another way of saving the logic bomb. So that's why I, I particularly don't like hibernation. Shut it off. How can you, how do you make them different? What's, how do you turn on the sleep and how do you turn on the hibernation? Um, if the computer, uh, most, excuse me, most Toshiba com, uh, computers are configured so that when you uh, click on the start button and you click on the, the arrow beside shutdown, um, it will give you the option to sleep or hibernate. This one also has the option to sleep or hibernate. So, it, yeah, well, this is mine. It may not be there. Okay. Some computers have it, some don't. If they have the capability of hibernating, you can do it from the start menu. Or um, with uh, a configuration of power saving, um, the, if you don't use it all day, then after five or six hours, the computer will not go to sleep. It will hibernate. So when you tap the space bar, instead of take, coming back in 10 seconds, it takes a minute, minute and a half for it to come back. Well, that's hibernation. Okay. All right. That's that question. Any, any others that we can think of? Yeah. So okay. Sometimes We're, I'll go back and zoom it comes up right away. Sometimes yeah. I'll come back and it takes a few minutes. But other yeah. times it'll shut itself off. Yeah. Um, it all that that all depends uh, too on what the computer is doing at the time. Um, if you've uh, put it to sleep, it, it's still able um, to uh, load an update. Okay. It's um, it's put the screen to sleep, but if it's doing something like getting ready to load an update, it won't it won't uh, sleep the hard drive until that's done. Um, so we're in the uh, power options now of the control panel, and there's lots of things we can do here. So let's uh, look at the balanced plan, this one up here, and we'll look at um, changing the options. Uh, 
in the settings. Um, now I've clicked on change advanced power settings down here. It's, it's, a, it's an entry in, in the power options that you'll have. And it opens a second panel that you can do very specific things with the uh, power button in the lid. Okay, so I've, I've clicked on uh, what the power buttons do and the lid. Okay, uh, so you get your power button, turns it on and off. You, uh, in some settings, you can just use the power button to put it to sleep. Okay, if you don't want to close the lid and, and work the hinges, you can just tap the power button and it'll go to sleep. In other instances, you tap the power button and the computer will turn off. It will shut down in order. If you really, really have to, you can hold the power button down for more than a couple of seconds and it will do a hard shutdown, which it can be a bad thing, but if you really have to, you really have to. Um, so when we close the lid on this computer, uh, we have the option on battery to put it to sleep or when it's plugged in to put it to sleep. And we can change that just simply by clicking on it and it gives you another drop down box and you can say when I close the lid do nothing that means it's going to keep running and the screen will not go away it, everything will be there um, you can put it to sleep you can hibernate or you can shut down when the lid closes okay um, so these are these are all the changes the the deep setting changes that you can make in the power options um, they are there for that um, the power button actions will override what the lid does. And in my case, when uh, I've set it so that when it's on battery, just go to sleep. If I, if I uh, hit the power button, just go to sleep. Or when it's plugged in, I know I want to shut it down. Okay, so it will shut down. If I tap the power button, it, sh it shuts down in order. If you have a sleep button on your computer, um, the actions of the sleep button will override the actions of the power button, in my particular case anyway. So these are things that you can do. Um, we'll get out of that for a second. Um, when it's, when your computer, if your laptop is on battery, um, you want to dim the display um, after a couple of minutes. That, that means that you're getting up and you're going to get tea. Dim the display. It saves battery power. And when you come back, if you just tap the space bar or move the mouse, the display comes back up to full power. Um, you want to turn the display off if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time. That will save enormous amounts of battery power. So you can leave it for an hour if with the display turned off and you've only used 2% of the battery power with the display is turned off. If you've left it for an hour, you may have used 50% with the display on. Okay. And after all of that, if nothing happens, then the computer will go to sleep and it will use a minimal, um, minimal amount of power. In other words, after four or five hours, it has gone through 1% of the battery. Okay, screensavers are quite something else. Um, by the way, when it's plugged in, I say never do any of these. Yeah, well, ne never dim the display, never turn off the display, and never put the computer to sleep. Okay? Because I don't want to go through the brouhaha of getting it back up and running again. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, screensavers were invented uh, for the computer for CRTs, uh, the big glass monitors, okay? For that puppy over there behind you, the one right behind you, invented for CRTs. Um, if the computer was left running, um, the icons that appeared on the screen and the taskbar across the bottom 
and whatever you had up and running on the screen, after a few hours would start to burn into the phosphorus. Okay? Because they did nothing. They, they didn't change in any way. And so the, the white part of the screen would start to burn the phosphorus because it's very hot. And so the screen would burn in and then you'd get ghosting and stuff like that on your screen. The screensaver was invented to uh, ameliorate that problem by making the screen go black and then showing a picture across the screen that kept the, the, the phosphorus fresh so it wouldn't burn. So it turned a phosphorus um, on or off, on or off, as a light passed over it. Uh, and that kept it fresh. That's what the screensaver was for. Um, in this, in the modern age, you can put a screensaver on and, and use it like a, a picture frame. You can have the screensaver display your picture folders. Okay, and and yeah, and, and you know, as as a, a very expensive uh, picture frame display. Okay. Um, but other than that, the original purpose for what they were used for is no longer valid because screens don't burn in anymore. You can leave it up and running all day if you want to. Now, it has a, um, it might have a light bulb in the display that when it's turned on, that's what lights the screen. And the more time you leave it on, it's like any light bulb, the less hours you get out of it. Okay? Turning it on and off does not bother. It's how much time it's left on. And giving it a good crack with your fist can also break it. But um, so screensavers, uh, they're, they're a nice to have if you want to have it tootling away in the background and have uh, a thousand cats appear every day or your grandchildren or whatever. You know, you can get a thousand pictures of cats and just run it through the screen. That's screen savers. And you can configure them um, in, um, in, the, in the control panel as well. Anything else? I can't get that white thing on for uh, updating the 10. It's not there? It's not there. And I can't figure out why because my uh, little thing is all green ticked off and it's updated. Yeah. I, I can't figure any other reason. I've gone to my control panel yeah. to see if I can find anything. Um, as far as, as I have been able to determine, um, if your computer is completely updated, uh, now it may happen next month on Patch Tuesday. That patch may come in. But what, it do, what it's doing is it's just putting uh, a folder on your computer and telling the computer it's there to be ready for the download of Windows 10. Right. Uh, and when the, um, and, and like I said, when we talked about this icon, this Windows 10 icon, um, when you when you reserve not so much your copy, but uh, when you reserve with uh, Microsoft the fact that you want the Windows 10 download, um, you have to tell it yes, I want it by clicking on the button saying give it to me when it's ready. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it hasn't turned up yet. It didn't. It had not turned up on. Your computer, Brenda. Yeah, after I did, I did, I did it. Well, uh, it may. Yeah. Okay. So it, it may not turn up again. I'm not sure. Uh, but I was thinking it was going to turn up on your computer again. The reason I say that is that uh, a couple of days ago I had to roll my ma my main office computer back a few days before this update came. I had to roll it back because uh, of a bad update and um, when I redid the updates the Windows 10 icon reappeared. So that tells me that it is an update that Windows is taking to make this Windows 10 icon appear. 
It may not come until Patch Tuesday next month. Or, or this month. Yeah, the second Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month is Patch Tuesday. It may turn up after that. Yes. Well, wow. okay, that that, now that's that's a good tip. I'm glad you told me that. When I checked my computer, my laptop, the icon wasn't in the where I expected to find it. So I went to search. Google search? No, like you know when you in the charge bar. Oh, in the charge bar. Yeah. Okay. So so you you you've also got that that it's exact it's it's. Might be the same thing up here. Uh, the uh, this on Windows Seven. This search here. If you go to, um, I would say, my uh, go to the computer. Yeah. Okay. You can try this, Ron. You 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 can um, um, put in um, what did you put in? Where is my or or just yeah. Where is my? Windows Ten. Upgrade, yeah. Put it in. Try that. Put it in the in the search. Where's my Windows 10 upgrade? It may turn up. Okay. And when do, when do I do that? Anytime you want. No, you want to open my computer. Oh, just open on my computer. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. All right. Just open. Yeah. My computer. Yeah. Now I know this one's not going to do it because I have not allowed this computer to update since I loaded Windows 7 on it. It's Windows 7, um, 7.1, and I have never taken an update on it. Now, if I wanted to take Windows 10, I will have to sit there and do all the updates. And at this point, there are, um, what did I say, there was 203 um, the first time around, and then this morning there was another 17. So there's, all, there's almost 220 updates to do to get to that point. <laughs> It, because your computer, to, yeah, to get Windows 10, yeah, to get Windows 10, your computer must be fully updated. Well, you know, I checked that. I checked search updates and it's yeah. fully updated. And yeah. Well, try that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, uh, I will try that myself the next time I'm looking at it. Yeah, if you if you say no to that, that's fine. I didn't check it off. I wondered. I was going to ask you. If no, I no, you don't have to check that box. Okay. It's just uh, Microsoft's way of of uh, and tracking you. And then I got the confirmation in, in my mail. Yeah. I see, I didn't yeah. get to see mine. Yeah. Now, now here's something. Yeah. Here's something. I I did mine on my office computer before I did my wife's computer. As a matter of fact, a couple of days before. And I clicked off, yes, send me a confirmation. Nothing yet, folk. Me neither. Yeah, but um, I did it on my wife's computer on my same network. Okay, she got one the next day. Mine said that it's going to come when they do it. Yeah. Oh, I got mine. No, what, the confirmation that you're looking for is, yes, we understand you want the update. Yeah. And it gives you a whole bunch of other stuff about what yeah. 10 is going to do. Yeah. How do you save that to the desktop? What that email? Yeah. Uh, is how did how did you get it? Did you get it? Uh, in my email. Okay, and and you're using uh, Outlook, Express. Outlook Express. Okay, uh, you can simply open Outlook Express, take that 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 envelope for that email, yeah. and just drag it over to the desktop, and there it will be. I've got the charms. No. Oh, okay. No, you don't have. You did not have Outlook Express. Okay, let's let's be clear here. If you're talking about Windows 8, you're you're talking about either um, Windows Live Mail or you're talking uh, Outlook.com. That's you log into Outlook.com. Now, in that case, you can't save it to your desktop. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to. Uh, if you want to save it as something important, 
you make a, you can make a, another folder in Outlook.com called Important Stuff That's and throw it in there. Yeah. And on 8.1, it doesn't give you that. So I don't know how I feel. If you, that. yeah. So uh, I'm not. It had to be there sometime. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it may be uh, across um, the, the um, a bar across the top where it gives you the options of what you can do with a piece of mail. Or it might be if you right click on the, uh, on, yeah. The yeah. Or if you right click on your inbox. Uh, it may give you the option to make a folder. I'm not sure. I don't use Outlook.com. I use Gmail. So, um, I know they're all different. yeah, they're all different that way. So you got to fiddle with it. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Well, you get ten. Will it have any effect on live mail or documents? Or it is not supposed to. It's just like the operating system changing. Yes. Yeah. It is not supposed to. <laughs> um, but that's why I'm waiting and I'm telling you folks to wait until I give you the word because nobody is sure what will happen with some of these critical programs, particularly Windows Live Mail. Like I said, it's delicate. It's delicate. Something might happen to it. Now here's another, the one last thing about Windows 10. It is the only operating system that Microsoft has ever put out in which if you don't like what you've got or something went wrong, you can roll it back to where you started. So if Windows 10 loads and there's something wrong with it uh, and you don't know how to get out of it, okay, there, isn't, there will be an option to roll that upgrade back to Windows 7 or 8 or whatever you have. Even this even the reservation it says if you decide you want that you don't want to reserve it at this time, just cancel it and you can reserve it at later. Yeah. Um, well as far as I understand it, this is how it's going to work. Once you've made the reservation and you're notified that the download is available or it has downloaded for you in the background, uh, okay, at that time you can say, I don't want to do it right away. Yeah, Put yeah. it off for a month. Yeah. Okay? You have a year afterwards. Yeah, that's you have one year. Okay, that's it, folk. That's the hour. Thank you so much. That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.